Hello, my name is Tom Hayes. I'm Director of Customer and Community Relations for New Jersey Natural Gas and your host for Community Connections here at SCAN. Uh, today, we're very happy to have with us uh, Kathleen Hollihan, who is a licensed clinical social worker at the Monmouth Medical Center Southern Campus. So welcome. We really appreciate having you here with us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, and I know we have a very interesting topic that uh, probably a lot of our viewers are, are probably going to be interested in, and that is uh, really talking about grandparents that are, that are really helping to raise their, their grandchildren. So your group, what is, you know, is the Grandparent Support Program. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and when it began. Okay. The, there are probably in this country about 10% of all children right now are being raised by their grandparents or mm -hmm. other extended family members. And so seeking to feed, you know, kind of fill this need, in 2009 we applied for a grant to begin a program for grandparents who were raising their grandchildren. Uh, luckily, we received the grant, and I was lucky enough to find a woman who was in social work school named Janice Marler, who was really also interested in the same subject. And together, we began the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren program mm. in 2009. And it's continued to date with the Lakewood campus, and at one point, we were up at Monmouth Medical. Um, and at another point, we were in Tom's River. So we're pretty much all over the place. Okay. The, the program really is to provide emotional uh, case management support to grandparents who primarily have custody of their grandchildren. Okay. Um, these people themselves are aging. Now their children are growing older. So it is becoming a much more dramatic problem and issue than it had previously been. Mm. Wow. So, like, do folks have to pay for these services? No. No, the services okay. are all free, and the services have been grant-funded um, since their initiation. Obviously, the, the, you know, the cost of office space is picked up by Monmouth Medical, but all of the other costs have been privately funded since that date, and it's at no charge to the grandparents. Okay. And I know you said that um, it's usually grandparents that have custody. So this isn't for grandparents that are just like watching their, their grandchildren while, the, while their children are at work. These are grandparents that really are taking care of these children full time. Correct, correct. Although we have had people who've come in because they have substantial involvement. Um, either they, ha they may have a child living with them and that child has a child. So they're, they're really more involved with raising their grandchild. Um, or we have people who may take care of their grandchildren five or six days a week. Okay. Those people we also consider to be grandparents raising their grandchildren because they are primary support for their grandchildren. So right. anyone who considers themselves to be a primary support of their grandchild is welcome to attend. That's great to know. So they don't necessarily have to have custody, but, but really have to be pretty well involved. Right, you, right? substantial so, involvement. Gotcha. Okay. So how often does this group meet and what types of things do they accomplish? Okay. This group right now meets once a week and it meets on Wednesday mornings and it meets from 1030 to 1230 on the Lakewood campus at Monmouth Medical Southern Campus. They become involved with all kinds of things. We do case management for people who may need assistance. They themselves are an enormous support to each other. So they help each other with child rearing tips, with the difficulties of being a grandparent, raising a grandchild. At times they've had holiday dinners together because maybe they don't have family in the mm. area. So they're really a huge support to each other. And together we all kind of manage what is probably one of the more difficult jobs that I've ever seen. Mm. Most of these people who are taking care of their grandchildren are living really on social security, um, and, and it really is a heroic task for these people. They love their grandchildren. They didn't want their grandchildren to go to the foster care system. So they stepped up to the plate. Um, and if we consider how difficult it is raising children when mm -hmm. you're younger, consider, you know, being in your 70s and all of a sudden you have a grandchild. Um, nobody invites you to a party anymore. Nobody is there to help you out. And mm -hmm. you go to school events and you know you're older than everybody else there and it's, it, it's really very difficult. Right, right, wow. That's, that sounds very challenging. It is, it is challenging and, and the people who do this really are heroes and they really have put their grandchildren above all else which is very, very difficult because a lot of times they have to make choices between their grandchildren and their own children. Right. 
So they really have done an amazing, amazing job. These are people who are going into school and into classrooms and they're saying, I never knew this math. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, I don't know what they do in school anymore. So they're doing something for allegedly a second time that they really never did for a first time because right. so many things have changed since they raised their own children. Right, right. That's amazing. So those sound like some of the challenges, but I would imagine there's some rewards for these for these grandparents oh, as well, right? There are amazing rewards. I mean, these children are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful children. Um, they are really like engaging and bright and really, really nice kids. Um, I don't know, you know, if the grandparents are going to feel that way when they're all teenagers, but certainly <laughs> they do. They do feel that way now. Um, we have at times run children's therapeutic support groups for the children to help each other so out. I was going to say because you know the grandparents have their perspective, but then there's also the grandchild themselves that are in a different situation where they're being raised by their grandparents, not their parents. So there must be a lot of, of challenges associated with that too. There, there really is. It's, on the one hand, they really understand the kind of sacrifices that their grandparents have made in order to raise them. So there is a whole lot more of a sense of obligation to their grandparents mm. because they really understand, you know, if, if you have a child, well, it's your obligation to raise a child. It's not your obligation to raise your grandchild. So there's a, a heightened sense of obligation. There also is some difficulty. You know, your parent is not as young as everybody else's parent. Right. Um, your parent is generally very, your grandparent is generally much stricter than everybody else's, um, you know, grandparents. I had one child tell me that, that, you know, the grandmother finally let her go to the park. And she said, I looked around and all of a sudden I found that granny was circling the park in her car mm. <laughs> um, because they, they don't have the same kind of freedom maybe that other children have. So it, it, again, there are joys and there are difficulties. Yeah. Well, you know, I know with my own children, you know, we would often be worried and nervous about things. And, you know, generations change and it's harder for an, an older, like a grandparent and the, and the situations they were in when they were raising children to today, they look at today and what's going on in the world and they're worried about everything. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it is frightening. Yeah, and, and, and of course they don't understand the technology and they can't figure out, yeah. you know, one woman came in and said, oh my God, I took away my granddaughter's cell phone and she managed to get through a telephone conversation by going through an Xbox in the house. So, you know, they're, they're way ahead of the grandparents yeah. in terms of the technology. Yeah. Now, what advice would you offer to somebody who might be looking or considering to get into the situation where they take, take more charge of, with their grandchild or take custody, whatever it might be? I, I would really say that you really need to involve the whole family in the decision. You know, most of the times grandparents have other children, um, they have other grandchildren, and, and so bringing in a grandchild kind of shakes up the entire dynamic in the family. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you have one grandchild who has a more prominent place in your life than your other grandchildren. You know, that causes dissension. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it ends up that, you know, you're taking care of your grandchild because maybe your daughter or son could not take care of them. That causes dissension. So I would really recommend that it really be a family decision and that everybody in the family be involved and that they really go over how their lives are going to change once there has been this dramatic change in their lives. Mm -hmm. That is very good advice because often, you know, I'm sure the grandparent feels like they're kind of in their own little bubble and have to make this decision just on their own. And, and as you said, they're taking, uh, taking care of one grandchild and meanwhile there could be three or four others that are going to feel a little left out or not, they don't, you know, maybe grandma and grandpa don't care about me as much because, you know, they're with the other grandchild all the time. Kids are small. They don't, you know, always they understand all the dynamics. And a lot of times you want to protect your, the children from those dynamics and, sure. and not have to go into ex explaining why the one grandchild is, is with them and that sort of thing. So it does make sense that you work with the, with the other family members, especially the other adults your other children to let them, you know, have a, have a say in it and understand it as you, as you first step into it. I'm sure most families, they would want, you know, somebody to make sure they're taking care of the, these children that don't have, you know, the parents can't do it. Right? Sure. Sure. So it's, yeah, that's nice. Now, what are some of the situations that a, a, a grandparent would have to take custody of their grandchild? Um, there are multiple. Some, some of the grandparents 
took their grandchildren because there may have been, you know, an abuse or a neglect issue. There may have been drugs involved. Mm. And so it was either they take their child or their child went to the foster care system. There are other people in the group who have children who are deceased. And so they end up taking care of their grandchildren because their child is no longer there. living. Wow. And I remember one grandmother telling me that the saddest day for her was Mother's Day because her grandchildren would come in and, and be all excited about Mother's Day and be saying Happy Mother's Day, but her daughter was dead. Mm. And she said, I would, I would really try to, you know, go along with whatever they wanted to do for me, and then I'd go in the bathroom and cry. Yeah. And when you think about how heartbreaking that sure. is, you know, that you have the joy of having your grandchildren, but the sadness of having lost your yeah, child. Yeah, I would imagine that would have to be very, very difficult for, for any parent yes. to, to go through that. Um, how do they, like, really face the conflict of, of choosing between their child and their grandchild? Oh, it, 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 it takes a long time to, to deal with that. And oftentimes, it's, they keep thinking that their child is different and is going to be able to be a better parent. They're going to come and, around. Right. They're going to come around, and they end up being disappointed. Most of them have really gotten to a point now, and it takes a lot of work to get to the point where you really realize you've made this commitment and you really have to, to put that above everything else. And that's an incredibly difficult thing for people yeah, to do. It's a lot of responsibility. And, and it's difficult for a parent. How do sure. you say to your own child, I, I really, I, you know, you really can't do this. I'm going to have to choose your child over you. That's, that's a that's a terrible, terrible thing for a parent mm. to have to face. And with everything else these grandparents have to do, it's just one more thing um, that, that really is very difficult. Yeah, another heavy burden on them. Yes. That they're, that they're carrying around with them, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. And how does that affect the grandchild then, right? When well, because all, all children love their parents. Sure. So you always want to think that your parent is going to get better and your parent is going to come and take you. Um, sometimes they do end up really deciding for themselves that they are better off with the grandparents and that they know that's a more stable resource. That's but it, remarkable. It, it is remarkable, but it doesn't come without a real sense of grief on the part of these children. And they themselves are able to articulate, particularly to each other, what that kind of grief is like. When you have a parent who's living and yet you can't live with that parent, particularly when you have situations where the parent may then keep another child at home. Right. And so you're living with your grandparent and you have a brother or sister who's living at home and it's kind of, why are they living at home and I'm not? Yeah. Now we've got about a minute left. I just want to cover some, some other items. I, I know um, there, from what I've read, some of the background information, there's scholarships for college for, for, for grandchildren uh, for, in for these situations sometimes? Generally for children who've ever been served in uh, the foster care system or if children um, have been in the custody of an, outdoor, uh, an outside relative. There are all kinds of New Jersey state scholarships that are available. Okay. In addition, there are plenty of private scholarships available to colleges because these children obviously, if they're getting to college, they have a story to tell. Right. And quickly, do you have any contact information that you would like to provide to our, our viewers? Yes, you can reach either myself or Janice Marler at 732-730-9112. One, two. Okay, great. Well, we appreciate your time. We really appreciate this information. It's really, really helpful. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in the future. Bye, and wish you, you best of luck. And uh, we're going to take a, take a break, and we'll be back after this short commercial. Now's a great time to make your home more energy efficient, and the New Jersey Natural Gas Save Green Project is here to help. Take advantage of rebates and incentives up to $15,000, designed to make your whole house more comfortable, improve performance, and save you money. Upgrade your older, inefficient heating equipment, central air conditioning system, and water heater with money-saving, high-efficiency equipment. But don't stop there. Your new equipment will have to work harder, wasting energy dollars if your home is not properly weatherized by reducing air and duct leaks and installing proper insulation. Call the Save Green Project at 877-455-NJNG or visit savegreenproject.com and we'll help you get on the road to maximum energy efficiency and savings and explain how you may qualify for up to $15,000 in rebates and incentives. Call Save Green at 877-455-NJNG. 
Hello again. Again, I'm Tom Hayes with New Jersey Natural Gas, and welcome back to Community Connections. We're glad to have you with us. And we're also glad to have with us for the second part of the show, Jim Wynn, who's the owner of Comfort Keepers of Central Jersey. Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to be here. Absolutely. We appreciate your, your taking your time to, to spend some time with us and our wonderful viewers. Um, so tell us a little bit about Comfort Keepers. Um, basically, what we do, we are an in-home care company primarily for seniors. Um, and our mission is to ha let people age where they want to age. So we have about 120 employees that go into the individuals' homes and um, help them with many of their activities of daily living. So some of the care can range from just two hours a day to 24-hour living care. Mm. So the mission is to keep people at home safe and where they want to be. They want to go to a facility or assisted living, that's okay. We also take care of people in facilities also. That's interesting. So. Uh, uh facility that you would think most people can get some care in, you also offer the opportunity to have additional care or something a little more personalized, I would imagine. Absolutely. Um, a lot of times people go to assisted living um, and um, assisted living only has a certain level of care. So they're, if they're unable to take care of their needs, we try to keep them there so they don't have to go to skilled care or nursing homes. So um, we, will go, we go into a lot of assisted living facilities and just maybe help people get out of bed, help them get dressed, you know, help them do things that um, they can't normally do on their own. Right, okay. So your mission of your business is basically that, to be able to, to help people, you know, stay at home if they so choose, or do you have a Yeah, I mean, our mission, mission is, people think we're there just to take care of them, but actually our mission is to keep them independent. We want to um, make sure that they're able to do things, but they just, as we age, we need help with certain things around the home. So we look at it as we're keeping them independent, mm -hmm. but they're just getting help. So they're not, you know, they're not babysitters. Um, they're really, we practice something called interactive caregiving, which is meant to keep the senior active and engaged as far as what they eat, keep them moving, let them, let them go. A lot of times people can't drive, so we will drive them places or take them places that they may want to go. And that could be to the doctors, it could be to the boardwalk, you know, anywhere they really want to go. That's, um, we'll that's take great. Them. That's great because I know a lot of research shows that folks that have that kind of care have a, obviously a much better quality of life. But in the end, the cost of care is much less to, to keep somebody in their home and, and active like that as opposed to being, ending up in the hospital and, and sickly and, you know, all that sort of thing, right? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, it is, you know, 24-hour living care actually can be a lot less than, say, living in a facility. Mm. The government doesn't cover the cost, but um, yet it can actually be less than that. Also, in a lot of areas we um, reduce cost is that um, the readmissions to hospitals. People mm. get out of a hospital or rehab, we make sure they stay on their program. You know, um, they may get physical therapy at home, but um, the aides will help them with the therapy when the um, therapist is not there. Make sure that they're eating, weigh them, do things that they need. We have a full-time nurse that will come in and do visits. And again, um, readmission is very important because a lot of times when people come out of the hospital, within 20 days, they're back in the hospital. So right. we try to avoid those kind of situations sure. and make it so that they stay at home. In fact, sometimes the hospitals will pay for home care in order so that they don't have the folks ending up going back into the hospital. Right, okay. Now, where are you located? I'm actually located in Shrewsbury. Okay. I ran on Broad Street, you know, right near the Grove. Mm -hmm. Never shopped there. <laughs> <laughs> I know that area. Yeah, yeah. So we just moved from Red Bank. We just recently moved from there. Okay. But we cover, um, I also have an office in Edison, but we also cover all the way down to northern, um, northern Ocean County. So we go down to Jackson. Um, and Freehold and out west and then Brick, Point Pleasant um, and so forth. So we cover um, all of Monmouth County and then um, some of uh, Middlesex and then some of Northern Ocean. Wow. So the age usually will come from that area. Even though our office is located here, they usually come from the area that they're working. Right, okay. And uh, like, how did you get involved in, in this type of business? Um, interesting thing, I'd done something different for about um, um, 15, uh, actually 18 years, I was in the printing and advertising business. Okay. And um, that was changing, and I was kind of getting bored, and I wanted to do something that was a little more satisfying. So I started to 
look at different areas and I honed in on this field um, which I thought was changing. My wife's an occupational therapist. She thought with my personality it would be a good, a good fit. So um, I, was, I, I started to um, look around and I started looking at different franchises and um, this business came up for sale. It had been in the business for about 15 years mm. and three, year, three years ago I bought it from a previous owner. Okay. So um, since then we've grown quite a bit. You know, I acquired the Edison office and um, I enjoy it. Every day I go out, I meet with the seniors, the families. That's probably my favorite part, the paperwork and um, the management part probably isn't um, mm. as much, but mm -hmm. I try to meet every family that comes aboard with us, right. just so I have an idea of their case and what they need, you know, and then my nurse will go out and do an assessment. So, but that's the part I really enjoy is the dynamics of the family, you know, and um, sometimes can be challenging. Right. but also very interesting. Right, right. And I would imagine very rewarding as well as you're really helping folks live a better quality of life. Right. I find that the seniors, um, about 80% of my clients, I like to say, are actually resistant to my services, believe it or not. They, they don't really understand because our, our field is much different. You know, it's really grown in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, people live with their family you know, uh, or they just lived independently, or they mm -hmm. didn't live as long. So a lot of people don't understand what we do, and um, they're very uncomfortable having somebody come to their home or take care of them, mm -hmm. and they can be quite stubborn. And a lot of time, the children are driving are driving the um, um, the conversation. They know mom or dad really needs help, and and they can't always provide it. They've got their own families they're raising, right? The sandwich generation, and they're they're just overwhelmed. So you guys really come in in the right spot, uh, right? But getting the client to, to the person you're really going to be helping for them to understand that is a little more complicated. Right, because they think that we're here to take away their independence and mm. their way of life, and it's really not. It's here to actually help them. And as I explained to them, it, it helps their children because there's a lot of guilt that goes on with having to work and having to take care of your own kids and not being able to be there for your family. People right. live all over the country. We have people that call us, their family, their mom or dad may be, they may live in California, their mom and dad may be here. So, you know, there's always a conversation where we convince them. I'm finding that the younger, older generation is a little bit more susceptible to getting help gotcha. than, the, than the older generation. Interesting. But what's nice that I really find rewarding is somebody really does want the help and they need it, and we get somebody in there, we kind of talk them into trying it, and you see two, three years later, they've got the person there and they can't live without them, right. and they feel that it really enhances their, their quality. life. Yeah, their that, quality that, of that life. is great. Are there a minimum of hours that somebody could use your services? Um, we have what we call a turndown service, um, which is, we call it up to two hours. Um, and sometimes there's um, seniors that just need help to get out of bed. They may um, be diabetic and they can't get, you know, they s maybe sleep late and they just can't get out of bed on their own or they need breakfast and they might need somebody to clean up. And that we call as a turndown service, it's a flat fee, it's up to two hours. Um, and then ma mainly the, the minimums are about three hours. So you could, as little as have somebody come for just um, three hours a week uh, in one visit. Mm -hmm. So generally you get an eight out, it's two to three hours for them, you know, to, to make the trip. Mm -hmm. So that's really your minimum as far as your hours. Um, right. So a lot of people will start with one week and they grow over time, you know, to, you know, a few more hours or, you know. Right. So sometimes they move into 24-hour living care eventually because there's a lot of people that they want to be home. That's where they want to live. That's mm -hmm. where they want to die. Right, right, right. Now, your team members, I would imagine, get um, training, certain di different levels of training to, to be able to do this type of work in people's homes and all that. Yeah, um, we have um, we have a three types of care. We have um, what we have we call companion care, and that's where the aide um, basically doesn't touch the body. They take the senior places. They might clean up around the house, do some light housekeeping, cook them a meal, and they don't have to be state certified. They don't have to be a CHHA, um, but we have a training program that we put people through. Okay. You know, um, and that training program goes from everything to Alzheimer's to dementia to other types of care. Mm. And then we have what you call personal care, where the aid needs to be trained by the state or take a state program or class, a CHHA program. But again, they're also trained by us. I do monthly training with everybody, so where they have a lunch or a dinner, and they come in and they may have a guest speaker, or we may talk about topics such as lifting and things like that. Mm, okay. And then the third type of care is medical care, where we may go in and you know help people 
um, with wound care and things like that. Right, okay. That's a little more involved. More involved, yeah. Now, what are some of the challenges that you're finding in your, your business? Um, staffing is always a challenge, finding good people to work mm -hmm. for us. Um, and um, we are really good at keeping them happy. So turnover sometimes can be an issue, you know, when, when they leave. So it's important for us to keep them happy. Um, there's a big demand, you know, for our services. So um, filling cases can be somewhat difficult. As I said, the biggest challenge is the families and um, trying to have the parents understand what kind of care that they need. Right. You know, so. Right. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. It's a, a very interesting type of business. And uh, again, uh, having, you know, elderly parents myself, um, we went through that situation, had a 24-hour care for, for my father before he passed. And um, it was great. That person became part of our family. Like, you know, that, that training and, and that ability to be friendly and warm while doing a job and you know it, it's 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 not always easy i would imagine for folks but you know you train your people right and all that again they become a really key part of, of people's families yeah we become integrated in the family in fact um i had a client who recently passed and um they put our company in the obituary you know so mm. they actually felt that our caregivers and the company itself was so close to them that they felt it was necessary to mention us in the obituary which right. we were really honored you know, to have kind of had that impact on their life. Yeah. You know, and um, so. Now, how many employees do you have, roughly? 120. 120, right. Yeah. And how many, like, are in the office as opposed to out in the field? Um, I have five people in the office. Okay. I have a full-time registered nurse, you know, who's um, out seeing people and doing nursing visits. Um, Great. And then I have a, sched I have, um, a scheduler, and then I have a um, human resource person, you know, and then I have yeah. a general manager. Great. And there's me who actively works every day. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. Now, I know on a, on a similar related note um, to SCAN, certainly, you're a new member of, of the board here at SCAN, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah. You know. no, I, I think you're going to be a key, key player here. I, I, really, uh, I, I really have, you know, had, we had our first meeting uh, a couple of months ago, and then we had our little retreat the other day. And I, you have high energy. You're very upbeat and positive which I think, you know, motivationally makes you a great leader for your company. Mm -hmm. But it's inspiring for, for SCAN as well to have somebody with your background and knowledge and your, your line of business and knowing how much you respect and understand all the good things that SCAN has to offer right. for its members. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. Well, there's a lot of synergy between us and what SCAN does because our goal is to keep the seniors active right. and keep them having a quality of life which is essentially what SCAN is doing on a daily basis. Right. And um, so they're very parallel our missions in a lot of ways. Absolutely. So I thought it would be a good, you know, it's a really good fit right. as far as that. Now, if folks wanted to contact you quickly, can you tell us the best way to, to contact you? Um, they can call us at 732-530-3636, or they can go to our website. It's easy enough, comfortkeepers.com, um, and just um, plug in your zip code and my website will come up and it'll give you more information. That's great. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for being with us. Appreciate the, the time and all that great information. Uh, we appreciate all you do and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Take care.